Amen. Campus, are we fired up to be here tonight? Go, bro. Go, bro. Go, bro. Go, bro. Go, bro. Here. Think about it. it it's, Let's it's go. Been, it's really been like over a year now that that we as disciples, as the kingdom of God, have been in a quarantine situation where we've not been able to, to come together. Uh, we've we've really done an incredible job adapting with with the laws of the land, whether it's been our Bible studies, Bible talk, Sunday service, even the campus devotionals. There are so many of you on this call that have been baptized in the last year and you've never once experienced an in-person campus wow. devotional. Wowzers. You know, the, the Bible says that, you know, that blessed are those that were with Jesus and believe, but even more those that, that weren't, that don't see Jesus and believe. And in many ways, like, Blessed are those that we got to see campus devotionals, but even more those that haven't been, but are still fired up, that still believe, and that still understand the purpose of a true disciple. Let's go, Tyler. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And, and you know, Lord willing, soon, guys, we're, we're going to come out of this. Isn't that incredible to think about? Like, it almost it doesn't, like, make sense. Like, yeah, yeah, sure. We've heard it so many times. But, but God willing, here and in the next couple of months, and even by the, the projection of the latest of being like the 4th of July, we'll have true freedom from what we're a part of to be able to come back together. We're all going to have to start, you know, wearing good clothes again. We're going to have to start taking showers every day. We're wearing deodorant. Oh. We're going to have to care what okay. we look like. And we're going to have to really invest in different ways. It's going to be such an amazing time. And you think about it, like I, I look on here and, and right now we've got about 83. And the word that it says is participants. We've got 83 Zoom participants. And yet when we come out of this quarantine, when we come out of all of this, we are going to transfer we from what we understand from being participants to now being what God wants to call us to be and that to be true prophets. Amen. Oh, oh. Hey. Oh, okay. with the bars. And so tonight, got bars. I want to talk about and look and persuade you from the scriptures on how to go from participant to prophet. And Come that's on. the title of our lesson this evening. Oh, from God, participant to prophet. Oh. Come on, bro. Oh. Oh. Look on over in, in 2 Kings chapter 6. You will find the, the, the example of Elisha. And Elisha is, is in the Old Testament, an Old Testament prophet, OG right there, that was called to come after one named Elijah. We understand it's a spiritual foreshadow of John the Baptist preparing the way. He was the Elijah to come to prepare the way for Elisha. And so you've got Elisha, right? You've got the, 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 the Jesus figure of the Old Testament. And now we're going to look at someone in his life, actually, that wanted to only be a participant rather than a prophet. And let's look at this example and then make these radical decisions tonight that we're not going to be just a spectator. We're not going to be just a participant, someone who's just going through the motion. But all of us tonight will make that decision to become an incredible prophet of no, the Lord. Second on, Kings bro. chapter 6, down in verse 8. The Bible reads, now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such place. The man of God, Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel. Beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, 
my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered. So I can not I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. So they sent, he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord. What shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Wow. We stop right here. Wow. Amazing. We, we find where the, the prophet is doing what they need to do. They are, are, are providing for God's people, giving guidance and direction. And what's the response by the world? The world comes back hard on them. And it says literally the entire city becomes surrounded. And then you've got the quote unquote, the baby Christian who we find out his name is Gehazi. He wakes up to have a great quiet time. He's spiritual and he goes on out and he looks and all he sees, I don't know what that must've looked like. Maybe the city was inside of a valley or something, but the entire city, you can, he, he can hear all the horses neighing he could hear the chuckle, chuckle, chuckle of their feet. He could see all the soldiers. He could see the dust from the chariots. And immediately the circumstance became more than what he could handle or endure. And he says, oh, my Lord, what do we do? And we find the prophet. We find the man of God or the woman of God for us as the sisters. Their response is, oh, no, you're right but they had a godly vision of what was truly going on. He said, don't you worry, my friend. Don't you worry, my little baby Christian. Don't you worry, weak, concerned disciple. Don't you worry, Bible study. Those who are with us are way more, way, 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 way more than those that are with them. And our first point, you see, if we're going to go from just being little participants, just being a little screen on here that we can all do whatever, we can turn off our camera, we can do whatever we want, and we can just kind of participate, and we're going to become a prophet for God, then we've got to change our vision. Preach it, bro. Come on, bro. We've got to change bro. our vision. Yeah. You know, right now, we're, we're a little myoptic. All, all we see is right what's in front of us, this little square rather than seeing the big picture. And you know, that's what changes anyone. Is it not what changed you? When you were studying the Bible, right? And you were like, man, this is awesome. I, I love these people. They're pretty cool. I can tolerate them. And yeah, I see the Bible. I got to obey it. I want to do it. I'm willing to like, you know, entertain this for you guys. And, and you weren't really getting it quite yet. But then you got the vision. You saw the kingdom of God. You got the vision of where you really were in the eyes of God. And that vision gave you such a bigger and clearer picture than you could have ever imagined. And then you got baptized into God's kingdom. And then all of a sudden, you're trying to think to yourself, man, my, my vision's good enough. And then God is trying to show you an even greater vision. Come on, Tyler. Let's go. Come on, bro. And many of us, if we're going to transform the bay, if we're going to change this world, which we are going to do, then it's going to require, it's going to demand that every screen, that every participant is willing to shed that skin, is willing to lay that down, is willing to crucify themselves once more, to put all the chips in, to go all in and say, my life is not my own, that it belongs to God, it belongs to Jesus, I am set apart, I am distinct, I'm going to be holy for the Lord. And we must become those that we get a great vision, just like the prophets. Come on, bro. Let's keep reading here in verse 17. 
Don't Preach, bro. be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. You know, that's a pretty cranking household name, the Bands of Aram right there. You with me here, guys? Let's go. And we find right here, he goes, God, open his eyes. And he does. And he finally sees. He opens the eyes of the disciple, of the, of the participant, of the young servant. And yet then in the world, those that were attacking, God sent blindness on them. So they couldn't see. And so there was literally a darkness they realized. And so now because of the darkness, they rely on the man of God who leads them out of that place, takes them where they need to go. And they're set before and they realize and they go, we're done. We're dead. And yet instead of receiving the, the, the just penalty right there, they're given grace and they're given food in all of these ways. You see, God wants to change our vision. He wants to change the vision of the lost, and he wants to change the vision of disciples. That for us, we need to be those that as we lead people out of the darkness and we open their eyes, that what they come and they find is not just the judgment of the reality of their lives, but the love and the grace of God's kingdom. Mm. And that, in fact, many times, We've got to say, it's our love that's going to change the world. And we've got to change our vision that as we come out of this, this time, that our love must become deeper than it's ever been. We've had kind of a Zoom love. You know what I'm talking about? Like little chats like, love you, bro. LOL, ha, ha, ha. Oh, bro. All these things. But you know what we got to do now? We got to be ready to go the distance in our love. We got to be willing to push ourselves further. And that's going to change the vision. You go, whoa, whoa, that's not how much I wanted to love these guys or gals. That's not how much I wanted to love my Bible talk. Like, now I've got to go back to the campus. You expect me to actually show up for Bible talk now? Now we got to drive all the way to SF for devotionals at times? Come on. Now we got to, like, actually go, go to church. And I can't just wake up at 9.55 and click my button with my back screen. And as long as I look good enough here, then I'm fine. Like, like whoa, whoa. no. And it's going to be this love. And now we're going to try and convert people out oh, of that God. lifestyle who have been secluded in their own box and home for a year now. Right. It's time for us, family. We've got to change our vision. You see, the participant only sees what's in front of them. Come on, bro. But the prophet sees beyond and sees what is not there. The participant has limited vision. However, the prophet has unlimited potential and sees God literally in every situation. Come on, bro. As, as young or, 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 or maybe we're weak spiritually, you know, you've got to see God in everything. All we see is the problem. But a man or woman of God sees the solution behind it. A participant thinks about what they can't do. Oh. But a prophet thinks about what God can do through those times. Let's go, bro. And this is our mindset. This is our conviction now. 
You and I are galvanized in this. We've been forged through the fires of COVID. We've been forged through the fires of followers, of weakness, of hardship, and yet nothing has separated us from the love of God. Come on, bro. And now we've got to embrace this. This is not just Ole's conviction. This is not just Charvel's conviction. It's not just Victor and Abigail's conviction. That it's all of us. We're going to change our vision. And that these participants, as they become prophets, are going to literally see God everywhere. Come on, bro. And see the world change. You know, 10 years ago, this is crazy to think about, 2011. Boy, howdy, that was, that was the year for Shay and I. I was in London, 2011. I came back in January. Shay and I started dating January 21st. I came back right after that in February to LA. We took over the Inland Empire region as a dating couple. Then in April, two months later, we got engaged. Then three months later after that in July, we got married. We got appointed evangelist women's ministry leader. Shay graduated college and we moved down to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Woof! That's right. Shay and I and right. five others. There were seven of us. That was it. And only one of us kind of spoke Portuguese. And we believed that we had to change the vision as we went along the way. On, that stop. myself, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And God called me in the full-time ministry. I had to change the vision. I had to go tell my family, I'm going to move from Podunk, Eugene, Oregon, and be going to London, England. And the God changed the vision. You're going to go back to LA. And the God changed the vision. I had to go down to Brazil. Wow. And every time, God is trying to, 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 to open our eyes more and more in the midst of the adversity and the challenges along the way. You've already done it so many times, have you not? And our God has gotten us through so many things. And he's going to do it time and time again. We go down to Brazil. We go to share our faith. I'm super faithless when we go to share our faith this time. I just want to get open. And we go out to the campus. Many of us know the story. And, and somebody shares their faith with me. His name is Danilo Bataglin. Danilo studies the Bible Let's and go. he goes away. He didn't want to do it. He was recording all of our Bible studies on his cell phone. It's kind of a little, little, little sus right there. And I didn't know about it. He goes on vacation. He's at the beach at his family vacation. And he's on the beach with headphones crying because he's listening to the Bible studies. And he's realizing he's got to get right with God. Wow. He moves back to Brazil, studies the Bible, and gets baptized. Wow. Oh. Know, at Dang. the Come on, bro. University in all of Central and South America, the University of Sao Paulo, USPI. And then a young girl named Carol. Carol gets baptized. Danilo Carol, literally, we set it up, guys. Shay, we have this little skit where Carol had to literally fall into the arms of Danilo. And she fell into his arms, and it's been a love story ever since. They get married, and both of them will go and they get their degrees as engineers in the number one university. And God changes their vision wow. to not go make lucrative careers. Carol was number one in her class, could have got any job she wanted, but she changed her vision wow. for what God wanted to become a prophetess. They go into the full-time oh, ministry. My. They go and they go, Lord willing, or later, they go and they plant the church in Lima in Peru. Come on. Now, here's the thing. Oh, that must be easy. No, they don't speak Spanish. They speak Portuguese. They had to learn a new language. And guess how many they had on their mission team? Seven. Wow. Those seven in the last two years have grown to almost 60 disciples wow, in a country come on. where they didn't speak the language, they didn't know the plan, they Preach. just relied on God because God changed their vision. Is that not flat awesome? Come on, come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. Come on, let's go. For all of us, it's no different. God isn't calling you to, to, to learn a different language. Or dare we say the language he wants you to learn is the one of sacrifice, the language of love, the language of commitment, the language of obedience, the language of faith. 
and that he's showing you, he's giving you the book right here so you can learn it and you can speak it fluently and that your seven in your Bible talk can grow from 10 to 20 to 30, 40, 50, 60, that you put a disciple, it don't matter if it's in Lima, Peru, Sao Paulo, Brazil, if it's on the campuses, where God puts you, you can change that. Let's go, place. Tyler Steer. Come on, brother. Come on, Tyler. Brother. Look over in Jeremiah chapter one. Hello. Jeremiah chapter one, so you gotta change your vision. You know, the world's gonna change through the visionaries here tonight. I truly believe that. And even when you look at the context of the world, the world understands that. Who does, what do companies try to, to, to uh, you know, go after and quote unquote convert? Who do they quote unquote recruit? College graduates, they go after college students. All the way back in Daniel, King Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar, who did he go after? He went after the young, talented individuals from Israel in every place that they conquered. They would spend, they would spend three, three years. years. They would be unpaid interns. They would raise up through the education and the training that they got. And then they would be sent out. And he knew that was the way to take over the world. The Bible's been the truth ever since the beginning on how to change the world. Jeremiah chapter one in verse four. The Bible says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, not as a participant to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, the participant said, I don't know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. For I am Brian when I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? And we stop here. You know, it's incredible. Jeremiah, as a young, many understand to be a teenager, a young quote unquote boy, rocking the 24 7 belt. God said, listen, there it is. I have chosen you. And he was called by God to not just be a participant amongst God's people, but instead to become a prophet. And that's what God is doing tonight. Every screen, you've got to look it back in your own eyes and you've got to see that God is calling you to be a prophet. He's known this since the beginning. That's why he made you. He made you for that. Isn't that crazy to think about? He didn't like make you. And then he's like making it up as he goes along. Like, oh man, I guess, you know, Yusuf, I guess we can do something with this guy. Darn it. He figured out how to repent. Ah, now I got to come up with a plan for him. I got to prosper him. Ah, Tyler Hicks. Ah, cut and pick. Right, what are we going to do with this guy? I don't know what to do anymore. On, I guess we'll help him out. No. Before you were formed in the womb. God set you apart to be a prophet, a prophetess. Understanding that the Jewish tradition, you couldn't enter this, this priesthood, this prophethood until you're 30 years old. And so as he's younger, he goes, Man, I can't do it. I'm not ready for that. That's a, I'm still trying to live my life. I'm still trying to figure it out. And God goes, see, you've been trying to figure it out since you were how many years old? I figured it out since before you existed. And here's the reality. When you get to my age, you hit, you hit the, the, the 30 button and over. Here, here's what happens. It's a really oh, fascinating bro. thing. Your family actually doesn't care about your life right now. You think they do? Just wait till you turn 30. That's when they actually think you need to do something with your life. No one cares about your life until you're 30. And here's the idea. You didn't care about your life until, I don't know, you might not care about your life right now. 
some of you got to figure it out. You're like, you know, 21. You think you're like, I've got it all figured out. I've already planned. I've got my passion planner and it's planned out for the next 45 years. Oh, and I'm going to do this. Ah. My plan's even better. And I've already done that. Oh, and I'm bro. Thank oh, you. I have to be in this internship. You don't understand. If I don't do it, it ruins the plan. It ruins all these things. I know what I need to do. And here's the thing, guys. God cares about your life since before you were born. You want that alert? Come on, God's bro. God's got you. God's got you. Come on, bro. You know, for all of us, we've got to, 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 to rise up out of this, this participant mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There might not be something for you to lead right now. There might not be a Bible talk for you to, to hop into or a whatever, but you've got to have this mentality. You've got to have this ownership that you own everyone that, that comes out to study the Bible from your Bible talk, that you, you set a precedence and you wrap your arms around every brother and sister in your Bible talk, that brothers, you take every sister out on a date, that sisters, you take every brother out on a date, that every opportunity, you see yourself not as just a participant to think, hey, what can you give to me? What can I get out of this? But now you've changed it. The prophet goes, I'm going to proclaim. I'm going to send out. I'm going to deliver. I'm going to command. Uh -huh. And that God is going to use you to be that change in these environments. You know, in verse 11, he asks them, what do you see? You know, the question is the same for you tonight. What do you see? What do you see in yourself? What do you see and believe that God can do? What do you not see? What are you not seeing right now? What are, what are the circumstances where you just don't see God? And you've got to change your vision. You know, Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there's no revelation, where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. You know, you might be a, a young disciple. You might be in the faith here a little bit longer now. You've got to have a kingdom dream. What do you see? I think a lot of us, we, we, we've got like kind of like kingdom motives, kingdom hopes, kingdom ambitions. But like, what's your kingdom dream, baby? What do you just like, you, you just, you pray about it every day you want nothing more than to see this happen you've got to have a kingdom dream do you, do you want to be a part of a, a mission team somewhere do you want to see a bible talk started at a, a different campus ministry do you want to start to be a part of a certain kind of ministry in the church do you want to see your family or your friends get baptized do you want to raise up and be a bible talk leader do you want to go into the full-time ministry itself do you want to be a shepherd or a deacon do you want to be a song leader oh, no. do you want to transcend and raise up with kids kingdom in some way do you want to be a great servant and usher what do you want to do? You've got to have a kingdom dream, family. Because when you don't, you cast off restraint. And you just become a participant. And you're just participating in the kingdom of God. Rather than dreaming and scheming for God's people to advance. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, great scripture. What do you see? Well, first, you got to see a kingdom dream. Secondly, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You know, secondly, you got to see Jesus. And when you're just a participant, how quickly your eyes get focused on something else. You know, we become fixated on our jobs. We become focused on our, on our, our, our schoolwork and how much money we need to make and, 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 and our own health and, you know, uh, uh, you know, our interest in the kingdom and, and, and the problems of our roommates and, and critical of our leaders and, and all of this stuff. Rather than seeing Jesus, you got to fix nice. your eyes on him. You know, we can quickly take Jesus out of the vision 
our own visions and dreams are no longer with Jesus involved. We got greater dreams for the world than we do for the kingdom. You got to see Jesus tonight. And here's the reality. We take all of our character, all of our skill, all of this, and we put it into the world. And you know what the world gives back? Sure, it gives you a 401k. Mm. Yeah, it gives you two weeks paid vacation. Yeah, it does all this. But at the end of the day, you're just a number. You're just a statistic. You're just a means to an end. And yet we understand that in God's kingdom, no talent is wasted. No skill is diminished. But it's only used in a greater way than you can imagine to have an eternal worldwide impact. Let's go, Tony. As a result of that. I'm the result of that. Somebody saw me and said, you know what? My purpose as a Christian is greater than my, my, my fear or my anxiety or my doubt about this guy standing in front of me. And they shared their faith. Somebody did it for you too. Wow. That's got to be our purpose again. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Well, John chapter 4, 34 and 35. What else do we need to see? The Bible says, I'm Tyler. my food said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. See, we got to see the world for what it really is. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus saw the crowds as harassed and helpless. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Guys, don't let the exterior of people fool you. They are hurting so bad. You know, the the, the disciples here in San Jose in the campus ministry, they live in the colonnade. And we got together, it's colonnade, you know, it's like, it's literally like this awesome building across the street from the campus. And and we were like having a good time last night. And they started telling me the stories of what goes on in this place. Like, oh yeah, these people, they're always going to fight. Like one time, down in the balcony area, like literally in in, in like the quad area, there was like like three or four families literally fighting, like just going at it. But when you see them in the elevator, they're like, oh, hey, I'm good. No, I'm cool, bro. Yeah, yeah, this this, this is my, 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 you know, my Tinder date. You know, this is all, yeah, it's got a raise. Yeah, this, like whatever they think is going on. You know what I'm saying, guys? Like they try to act like they're so put together, but they're not now. The world is such a lie. And what's the challenge? You see, we've been conditioned to believe this lie. Yes, because of Satan. But because what happened? You've got family members who weren't disciples. And so they got their teeth knocked in by the world. They had lots of of like, you know, genuine love at first. And they believed in good things and jolly feelings and all of that. And then as their life got worse, they said, you know what? Life is meaningless. Just get money. Money will make you happy. You got to look out for number one because nobody else will. And so this is what was put into us. And we actually become convinced of it. And then we become disciples and we're like, we're like, oh, I'm so happy. It's so awesome. And then what happened? Sin enters back into your life via your own sin or somebody else sinning against you. You go, oh, I knew it. The kingdom was a lie. Full of lying liars who lied about it. Lying liar. And so what do we do? We just start lying around and we stop doing things for God's kingdom anymore. And you don't realize that when you realize the lie and you're lying around, the real lion Satan himself is trying to devour you and take you out of the kingdom. Oh, ah, come on, bro. Wow. Come on. That ain't no lie. But he's not a rapper. You know, imagine, imagine if we all came out of the Zoom era, no longer as participants, baby, that like all of us make the radical decision to be this way for God. It is flat game over. We come out of it as prophets who believe that we're called by God, prophets that see God in every situation, that we see Jesus in our vision for our life. We see the reality of the world 
and we see what God wants to do in Yover and Berkeley and Laney and Diablo Valley at Cal State Come East Bay and SF State, CCSF over at San Mateo, at Stanford, at Santa Clara, <laughs> San Jose State and City College and oh, everywhere wow. in between that we are the ones Come that on. when we step foot, no longer virtual feet, but actual feet and we bring the good news and we bring the peace and we bring the love and the conviction that a prophet and prophetess has. We know that God is going to do such great things. And then this summer, we send out a mission team to Santa Cruz. Come on. Right there for it. Come on. Transfer hey, bro. to see Santa oh. Cruz. We're going <laughs> to baby. We're going to be slugging it up over there. Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. We've got to have that Hello. conviction to Hello. change our vision tonight. Look over in 2 Kings chapter 4. Preach. Let's quickly go through a second point. Come on, bro. Second Kings chapter four. Come on, bro. What, what, what's the second thing we got to have happen if we're going to go from a participant to a prophet? It's a whatever it takes mindset. A whatever it takes mindset. We find the prophet Elisha with the servant Gehazi, the same people we just, we just read about there in Second Kings chapter six. And what happens is he comes to a, a small village where a family is there and this woman totally takes care of them. He says, what can I do for you? Uh, he allows her uh, to pray to God and praise God, give her a child. She wants a child. Later that year, she becomes pregnant. She gives birth to the child. The child starts to grow up, but then the child dies. And the test of true faith comes, not when we're given the gift that we so much wanted from God, but when God so takes it away for a reason that we don't understand. That's the true test. And too many have fallen away, have dropped the sword, have left the very family of God because the very thing that they loved more was not God, but what God could give to them. And we've got to make sure we love the Come creator on. more than the created. You with me, your family? Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. We just got our stimulus checks. Preach, bro. Are we praising God or are we more excited to buy something new for ourselves? Come on, Tyler. Come on. I'll tell you what. Shay and I, we, we got the stimulus check. And the first thing I thought, I can't wait to give back to God. Ooh. Flat loss. Come Praise on, God that we can do this. I'm thinking about Danilo and Carol down in Lima. I'm thinking about the Moranos down in Brazil. I'm thinking about over in the Middle East, we're going to send out church in Bahrain. I'm like, yeah, you can have my stimulus check. <sighs> Absolutely here. And we immediately gave. And many of us, we're in that same position. It's just frosting. You've been eating your cake. It's pretty clear. Some of you guys had COVID-19, but, but you got hit with the COVID-19. We got to get back in shape here, guys. We got to take care of ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Let's Come on, go Tyler. after it. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Eating the cake. Man, let's go. Let's give the frosting to the Lord. Oh, bro. Oh, and bro. for us, we got to have a whatever it takes mindset. Second Kings chapter four, down to verse 25. The Bible says, so she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to the servant Gehazi, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right. She said, isn't that such an answer typical of so many? Yeah. Yep. I'm doing great. And in this time, I think a lot of us, we're just not being honest. Like we're coming into our, our discipling relationships and we're, yeah, I'm fine. And like your life is in stress. Is school good? Oh, is work good? Life. Is your ministry good? Yeah, everything's good. And you're just lying, man. Get open, get real, get honest tonight. If something's dogging you, Something's just, you know, you feel it gnawing at the back of your ear right there. And you just know, you go, yeah, and you just got to get open. Why? Because you got to do whatever it takes. Let's keep reading here. When she reached, verse 27, when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away. Yeesh. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me 
and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you? Don't raise my hopes. Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So she got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff in the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and said, to him, the boy is not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And he stretched himself out on him. The boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha sh uh, sh uh, summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammites. And he did. When she came, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Whew. We find from participant to profit. And to get there, we've got to do whatever it takes. We got to do whatever it takes. I mean, isn't that how we were in the world? Like when we wanted something, we do whatever it took. Yeah. Any means necessary. Right. I mean, like, and we were relentless. I mean, the faith that we had in the world was epic. We moved mountains with our faith. We were bold with our faith. I mean, like you just take the, the themes of the years of, of being in the kingdom, you know, the year of boldness or the year of famine. Like mm -hmm. we were all about that in the world. We just yeah. didn't understand what it really meant. And now we find here that a true prophet doesn't take no for an answer. Come and we on. find the spectator, the participant, Gehazi, who wasn't willing to do what it took, who didn't know what was really gonna happen and didn't have the faith right there. You know, this is, this is the typical process of a disciple who wants to be great and is given that chance. We get a chance to, to lead a Bible study, a Bible talk, to disciple someone, to raise up, to do ministry, you know, and, and then we've gone through it. And so we just kind of go, ah, it's too hard. And, and, and we're not trying to be the prophet anymore. You see, we got to recommit ourselves. We got to recommit ourselves to be to this process that we were so excited when we were going to be given that opportunity. We're like, man, I can't wait to, to, to lead my first prayer. What? Oh, I get to be in kids kingdom. Oh, this is awesome. What? I like, I get to give special missions. Like I get to lead a Bible study. I get to disciple this person. Wow. I get to date someone. What is going on? Whew. And we've lost that love and feeling in that way. Come we got to get it back. We got to recommit ourselves to our, our discipling relationships, our discipling that we get from God. Because many of us, we've stopped letting ourselves be discipled by God. We've stopped opening our Bibles. We've stopped praying. We've stopped living this life as a disciple. And we got to recommit and recommit to our discipleship by the person, the prophet that God put in our life. You know, we need to be disciples as well when we lead, that we inspect and we equip our disciples to be successful. I think perhaps an idea is that Elisha didn't really realize where Gehazi was at. He's like, hey, Gehazi, you, you wanna try it? Here. And just kind of, you know, perhaps just kind of threw him the, the, the staff and said, you got this. You're ready. You got this. Take it away, Gehazi. Just run. I'll stay back here. I'm, I'm going to take care of the, of the sister right here and make sure she gets to her car okay. And I'm going to make sure that, you know, all these things, the logistics, I'm going to do all this. You got this. Rather than just go, okay, I've got to make sure they're thoroughly equipped. I'm going to make sure they know what they're doing. That when we get together in our discipling relationships, we open the Bible. That we use the scriptures. We call them to a decision from the scriptures. And the next time we get with them, we follow up with it. And we see it through entirely until there is change. And they are ready to do it as well. Come on, Tyler. Tyler. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You know, for, for some of us as well, if we're honest, 
we, we kind of like being the baby Christian, the perpetual baby. It's nice. You get all the, 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 the attention, right? Like if, you, if you're having like the meltdown, then everybody focuses on you, right? Come on, you like bro. the fact that you don't really have responsibility and, and everything you do is kind of cute and funny and everybody looks, <laughs> overlooks your offenses, you know? But, but, but too many of us, we want to stay stuck in this like baby bird place. Dang. We kind of want to stay in the nest, right? Like baby birds are really cute. I remember saving a couple of little baby ducks with my bare hands. Like, oh, it's so cute. Like, have like, oh, and then take them right there and let them, like, get them back to their mom right there. But the mother birds, what do they do? They chew up the food and then, oh, and they regurgitate it. And little babies are, chip, 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 chip. You know, it's really, really, really cute. Come on, you bro. You know what's not cute is like, a full grown bird or a full blown bird. Jar, 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 jar. You're like, dude, get out of the nest already. Say that, bro. And I think some of us, man, it's time to like get out of the nest. Come on. Stop being a perpetual baby bird. Ew. Spread your spiritual wings. Be willing to hit a few branches on the way down. It's good for you. It might knock some sense into you. You're going to see it's actually not as easy. We, we get surf. If you're in the nest too long, you chirp too much. Ooh. Come on. Come Let's on. Go. You Over just there. want to chirp away. Wow. If I let the Bible talk, That's a bar, bro. Better. I mean, no one loves me. After no one's taking it. And we're just like, well, we just start chirping away. Oh. Guys, like, no more chirping. We got to get back, back to a mindset and recommit ourselves. Man, I'm going to grow. I'm going to get out of the nest that all of us could lead a Bible talk, that all of us could lead through the first principle Bible studies, that all of us could lead a household, that all of us could disciple somebody. These are not full-time ministry things. These are disciples of Jesus Christ things. You with me here, family? This is what a disciple does. Oh, that's what the Bible says to do. Not Let's the go, Tyler. ICC or the right. company of prophets or whatever else you want to think. That's Come on, Tyler. It's the Bible on, that's bro. calling you to do that. That's what Jesus did for you. He got out of the nest. He was willing to feed you. He was willing to digest it for you. And we've got to do the same for others. You know, the participant does the bare minimum. I think some of us, we've turned into bare minimum disciples. Oof. What's the least I have to do? Come on, bro. Well, what, what, like, what's the least I, I, I need to, to go to? Do I have to be there? I mean, I know it's a, a, it's, it's a family quiet time, but do I have to be there for it? Do I have to ask my job for that time off? Do I have to come to every Devo? Do I have to have my camera on? Do I have to? And we're just thinking about the bare minimum. And we got to get out of that. The whatever it takes mindset. The prophet does whatever it takes. He goes in, you see, for, for, for the dead body, you touch the dead body, you know what happens? You become unclean and you gotta go out the camp. And so Gehazi was thinking about himself. He's like, he took the stick and he's like, okay, um, uh, I did it, didn't work. I don't know what to tell you. Here, you got back. I mean, I ain't doing that, that's stupid. Mm. And, and, and all of us have like a dead body barrier that we're not willing to break through. There's on, something bro. that we're not willing to touch or go there. It's an untouchable part of our life. And you got to ask yourself, what have you decided is untouchable? Like, yeah, I'll tell you all this, but I'm not talking about that. Yeah, 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 I will deal with that, but we are not going to go there tonight. You understand me? And we start to create these untouchable dead parts of our life. Rather willing to get in there, the prophet is willing to, quote, unquote, become unclean, is willing to do whatever it takes. The Bible says he got mouth to mouth, eye to eye, and hand to hand. What is mouth to mouth? You got to speak faith. You got to breathe life back into the dead situations. You got to be willing to get close and get in there. And you know what? Zoom has really put us to the test on this. How do you breathe through a screen? 
Mom, and yet so many are a testament to that. Love that. That God breathed life through you, even through a screen. Wow. You got to get wow. eye to eye. You got to really see and look. But what is a prophet? The prophet sees everything. They see what the person studying doesn't. They see what the person they disciple doesn't. You got to anticipate me. Sometimes you go, oh yeah, I looked. I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. They're doing great. Uh-huh, cool. But you, you anticipate the need. Come you on. anticipate the problem. You anticipate the weakness. And you got to get hand in hand. I think this is one of the keys right now as disciples. We need to be getting hand in hand. You got to take them with you. I think we're, we're, we're having like virtual, you know, kingdom. Right. Where we're like telling people, hey, you know, uh, I can't be with you, but you need to have a quiet time. Hey, I can't be with you, but you need to go share your faith. Hey, I can't be with you, but you need to have some Bible studies. Hey, I can't be with you, but I expect you to be fruitful. And we're just being Gehazis in these situations rather than getting hand to hand. To, I'm going to get up with you and I'm going to go pray. I'm going to go with you and we're going to share together with our, our mask on Soviet. I'm going to go and we're going to study the Bible together and we're going to baptize. And we've got to get back to this place in our ministries as we come out of this, because that's what it's going to take to get the job done. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You know, what's stopping you from whatever it takes to save others or bring them back to life? Is it just fear? You're just flat afraid. You're afraid of failure. I think the one that got us the most here, we're afraid of pain. Mm. We've gone yeah. through a lot of pain. There's been a lot of people that have dipped. And we all, had, we all had a, you know, a hand on them. We loved them. We like went the extra mile for them. And then they dipped. So the next person that studies, like we try to do this. It's kind of funny. It's not funny, but it's, it's, it's interesting. We try to like really, 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 really like make a disciple before we baptize them. But really what we're doing is like, I, I'm going to make sure when you come in the kingdom, you're not going to hurt me. And I'm not going to baptize you until I know you're not going to hurt me. And we set these like massive standards of what we expect people to do rather than just calling them to live a life of trust, a life of love by demonstrating that ourselves. And we got to be willing to be like Jesus who watched the 12 dip on him. He watches his family persecuted. He went through every hardship you can imagine. And you've only been doing this for a couple of years. Jesus took on the sins of the world, my friend, the sins of eternity. And we're mad because like they didn't get back to your text or they, they blamed them falling away on you because you didn't love them enough. Now pretty soon, now we take it out on the next Bible study. And we're like, you, you, you're going to be an evangelist before you get baptized. And I'm not baptizing you until then because then I know you won't fall. You better not be like that last person that I'm not going to tell you about, but I'm going to passively, aggressively take it out on you for that's the reason why I'm so harsh on you right now. Rather than just having the unconditional love, we got to get back to that. We can be all about selfishness. COVID's really made us selfish because we're just all about ourselves, especially disciples that don't live with disciples. Disciples that don't live with disciples, man, you've taken a licking during this time. It's been like hard on you guys. Disciples that live with disciples, you got stuff too. But those that are like made the decision, not because of like circumstance, but because they just didn't want to live with disciples. You know what happened to most of them? We don't see them anymore. Because they gave into selfishness. It became about themselves. You just care more. They cared more about their time, about more about their love and their priority. Pride. A lot of us, we just don't want to give up pride, man. We're just super prideful. It's impressive. Like, wow. It's really impressive. It's amazing. You could write a, a really good book about pride. That'd be awesome. You should do that. You should like write like, a, like little pamphlets and booklets on pride. That'd be awesome. I could do it too, guys. Oops. Pride. What is pride? Just thinking you know what you're doing. You think that you just know better. You know better than God. You know better than your discipler. You know better than all of these people who've been doing it for way longer than you and whose lives are actually harder. They're like married with kids and work a career. You, know, you don't know my life. My life's hard. I work at Subway for six hours a year. And I've got like one class that I take. And then I also, like, I don't have any other relationships that I'm responsible for. But my life's hard. 
you don't get it. I know what I'm doing. I got this. I've been a disciple. I just got baptized yesterday. Like, sheesh, it's just pride. Good luck. And we don't have to do that. That's, that's the crazy thing, guys. We don't have to do that. Mm. We just choose pride. Don't do it. Just don't do it. You got a disciple that's being prideful? You have my permission. You look at him, he's go, bro, don't do it. Sis, don't do it. Or as Jason says, bro, sis. Don't do it. <laughs> Come on, bro. Bro, sis is going to repent big time. You have to marry family. Yeah, I simply want to challenge us tonight with that mindset to go back to the situations you know you only gave your bare minimum in and go from the bare minimum to be a prophet in that situation. You know, reach out to those that fell away. You, you, you've been like maybe at a stick's distance. Imagine if all of us, we reached out to those people, you know they're hurting by now. You know life has taken a licking on them by now. It's taken a few bites out of them. Let's reach out to those people that fell away, the people that you're like, okay, I'll keep you at a distance, but I'm not willing to get unclean for you. They're dead. Let's bring them back to life. How about following with those that stop studying? They crushed your heart. You were like, about like you're about to, you already, you, you wrote down what you were going to share about them for their baptism and they ghosted on you. Mm. And you call them up and you share that. And you share the vision of them getting baptized. And you plead with them to come back to their senses, to come back to God. Tell them, don't do it. Don't tell them about the pride part. Just tell them, don't do it. Tell them to come back. Imagine if we got back with all those that we, we got in our phone books and we just never followed up. We got to get back out to those people. Don't be a Gehazi. Let's be an Elisha in these situations. You know, here in the church, we've already seen almost 40 people get baptized this year. Oh, 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 oh. We're at 78 days. Guys, that means that right now, Every other day, someone's getting baptized. Wow. It's incredible. Jeez. Come on, bro. Like every other day, someone's getting baptized. Like, oh, man, we blew it yesterday. That's okay. Tomorrow we got, we got this. Okay, cool. Like, wow. It's just amazing to see how many are getting baptized. And here's what's amazing. All of them are staying faithful right now. That we're Let's go. for them to be faithful. That shows you are being prophets that you do know what you're doing, that God has called you and you've put it into practice thus far this year. Come on, That's man. all been with the quarantine. That's all been with almost nobody on the campus itself. Come on, bro. Like you go there and there's like, there's like homeless people and there's like, you know, little dust wheels rolling around. That's <laughs> about all that's on campus right now. And yet God is still doing so much through your faith. It's incredible. I believe that we can see even more happen. If we kept on pace, it'd be about 180 baptisms. I think we're going to kill that, guys. Like, oh, bro. Like, not in a boast. Like, I'm just been like, man, think about it. Like, like, just the way things are going, and, and, and we're going to be all, we're all going to be prophets on these campuses, and we're going to have like thousands upon thousands of people to reach out to here pretty soon. And, and everybody and their cousin is just going to be like just screaming for like social interaction. You're going to walk up to somebody. Like, hey, do you want to? Like, yeah. Like, you, know Come on. Ex, you know how many extroverts we're going to convert from this, guys? Like how many of them are just dreaming of having somebody to hang out with, to have a friend? You know how many introverts right. have gotten so dark that like they're one willing of them. to do whatever because they just Come want on, somebody bro. to listen to them? We're not ready for a fan, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to be crazy. I mean, last week we had daily editions. We saw seven get baptized. Come on, let's go. I mean, already in the San Francisco region, they've had nine be baptized and Lord willing, one more. That's 10 baptisms this year. Let's you know go, what that SF. means? They have an almost weekly baptism in just one of the regions in SF. And now the are growing, and pretty soon we're going to see weekly additions in every single region. That's scary times, my friend. That's awesome. That's your faith. God willing, tonight, Aaron over in the Berkeley campus yeah. is going to get baptized. 
Let's Come go. on, let's go. Let's go. Like, don't take that for granted. We're going to have a baptism at our campus devotional. Yeah, That's yeah. flat awesome. We need to be celebrating that. Be fired up about that. And we need to be a little indignant going, you know, when is my campus ministry going to baptize at Devo? When is my Bible talk going to be fruitful at the devotional? That's what we've got to dream about. That like, like we got every campus ministry fruitful at one devotional. There that's it gonna is, taste bro. Good. Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler. You know, there's so many we got to bring back to life. I so appreciate our sister Jenna over there in Silicon Valley sharing about her mom. Yeah, come on, Sonia. Uh, Sonia. That so Sonia. Sonia is going to be brought back to life. That Shay and the sisters here in, in San Jose, I'm telling you what, they got mouth to mouth eye to eye and hand to hand with this girl to pull her back out of the darkness and get her back into the kingdom. To see James Mendenhouse studying over there in Haywood. Let's go, James. James. Welcome Welcome back, bro. To bring him back to life. You see, when all of us choose tonight to no longer just be a participant and we embrace our calling to be a prophet, We'll see the greatest force this world has ever seen. Men and women who change the very visions of others, the very kingdom of God, an immovable mountain. And that is it. This mountain calls others to go into the sea and to be baptized as we baptize the nations into Christ. Men and women who have that vision and that mindset to do whatever it takes. You know, a couple of days ago, we had good old St. Paddy's Day right there. Yeah. And the greatest Irishman to ever, ever live, Conor McGregor. Yeah. <laughs> what did he say? Amen, bro. He said, we didn't come to take part. We didn't come to be a participant. We came to be what we're supposed to be. He's known as the chosen one. We came to be the chosen oh. people of God. We came not to participate, but to take over every place we set our foot. That tonight we go from, yes, strength to strengthen our lives. We go from here to there. We go from wherever God calls us to even greater heights. We go from Zoom screen participants to who we've been called since birth to prophets itself. I love you guys so much. Let's go. Come on, Tyler. Come on, Tyler.